When I started off in grad school, uh, this is something that I spent a lot of time doing. So this is basically me doing reward engineering. What's going on is you can see a bunch of sliders at the top, and they go for features that control how far the properties of this robot arm. So how far away it is from people's head, how far away it is from the table, don't break the vase, things like that. And then you spend a bunch of time tweaking these sliders until it does what you want. And at some point, it'll get to the point where it's doing what you want it to do. And then you go to some new situation, and it does something like this. Uh, in case you can't tell, it's not supposed to go through the vase. That's a bad thing. And so the question that I started thinking about is, why is it so hard to do this process of setting goals for AI systems? And so here's kind of another example of an AI system. This is done with deep reinforcement learning. Uh, and in this case, there's no bug in the algorithm. It's doing a perfect job optimizing its goal. Um, but it's clearly not doing a good job of boat racing. I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on what exactly it is optimizing and what went wrong here. I can't actually ask you the question like I would like you to, but just take a moment, think about it. If you've seen this before, put the right answer down. Otherwise, take a guess. And what, what happened here is the system designer wanted to, to program this game. And instead of having access to the source code, what they had access to were the screenshots. And they figured, well, there's this nifty little score thing in the bottom. Maybe if we just set that as the goal for the system, we'll get something that'll win the race. Presumably, a high score would mean winning the race. And in this case, what happens is it turns out these green turbo balloons are worth points. So it's discovered this kind of ingenious strategy where it's spinning in circles, collecting effectively infinite points. Um, and this led me to, to think a lot about these problems. And ultimately, I view this as a phenomenon called Goodhart's Law. So Goodhart's Law is, as stated, once a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So what do we mean by this? Well, when we say measure here, we're talking about some way of keep, like measuring something in the world or identifying some property. So in this case, we identify perhaps a relationship between score and the probability of winning. When we set something as a target, that means we set it as a goal for some sort of optimization-driven system. In this case, the system designer is saying, get a high score to this reinforcement learning problem. And then what does it mean that it ceases to be a good measure? Well, as we optimize that score function, we find that this relationship stops holding. And eventually, we get this sort of boat spinning in circles over and over again. Now, this is a really old phenomenon. When I put this up on the slide, a bunch of folks laughed. And it's because this is something we're all intimately familiar with. And in the field of economics, there's like my favorite paper of all time with a paper title that just summarizes the whole thing. So what it's called is On the Folly of Rewarding A While Hoping for B. And it says, numerous examples exist of reward systems that are fouled up. The behaviors which are rewarded are those which the rewarder is trying to discourage. So this is something that occurs all over the place. One more just example uh, from history is this example of the, what's called the cobra effect. So this was colonial Britain. Uh, they were in India. There was a real problem they had with cobras. They wanted fewer cobras, so they created a bounty on cobra heads. Bring in a cobra head, they would give you money for it. It started off working well until some people realized they could start breeding cobras. And well, you can see that that clearly sort of took things off the rails. So the, the colonialists realized, OK, we should stop doing this. They shut it all down. And then you know what happened? All those now worthless cobras got released. So the problem was actually much worse off than when you started. This also shows up in AI systems. So here's an example in a healthcare setting where they were trying to determine individuals in need of specialized intervention programs and which intervention programs are likely to have an impact on the quality of individuals' health. And they were an insurance company, so they used predicted healthcare costs for this. Maybe that would be reasonable, you might think, but there's certainly a gap set up where we have costs is equal to some underlying property of health plus a specification gap. And in some really interesting work by Obermeyer and others, what they found is that this specification gap had a really large racial disparity in the way that the system prioritized care. The x-axis here is showing the algorithm score. So further to the right means the algorithm thinks you're at higher risk. And the y-axis is showing a much noisier but much more robust measure of health, which is the number of chronic conditions patients have. And then these two plots are showing them across different races broken down by black and white in the US. And what you can see is that for the same level of risk the algorithm identifies, white patients are substantially more healthy than black patients. And you can realize that this is due to kind of this gap in, in the proxy measure being related to sort of historical marginalization and distrust in the medical system. 
This also shows up in scenarios with autonomous driving. So here's a paper uh, from 2023, so very recent, uh, by, by Knox et al. It looks at reward misdesign for autonomous driving. And basically what they did was they grabbed, they created a bunch of sanity checks to find flaws and reward functions from the literature. And then they went and found a bunch of reward functions that were being used and applied these tests. I want to walk you through one of them. This is called pulling out indifference points for driving risk. Basically, you take three trajectories that a car could go on. The first one is one with a crash, definitely a bad thing. Another one is one where the car doesn't go anywhere at all. And a final one is one where the car drives safely to its destination. And then what you can compute is what is the probability at which you're willing to accept crashing in order to drive to your destination? At what point are you indifferent between staying still and accepting some risk that you'll crash? And then you can use this to like, detect or estimate a, an acceptable level, an acceptable crash rate. So they took this and they placed it kind of on this type of plot where we're saying you know, how many kilometers you have to go per, per collision. Further to the right means you're safer. And here's kind of some stats from the United States driving. Right? So you know, US uh, 50 to 60, over there pretty safe. You know, 16 to 17 year olds, definitely less safe. Drunk 16 to 17 year olds, much less safe. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of space on the left here, so you probably know what's coming. Uh, because most of the uh, reward functions that they looked at were sort of over there, these two down here. And then actually most of them failed a basic sanity check where they didn't even make it onto this plot. And they, they summarized it pretty well, which is to say that uh, nine of the papers they looked at, zero required driving more safely than a legally drunk 16 to 17 year old. The most risk averse reward function by this metric would approve driving by a policy that crashes 2,000 times as often as our estimate of drunk 16 to 17 year old US drivers. So reward design is hard in systems economically from our history. It's difficult in toy research systems. And we can see that in deployed AI systems, we also see these issues with proxies that arise all over the place. So how do we study this problem? Well, one of the sort of things I looked at in my research was trying to build up this game called the obedience game where we can kind of look at these properties of how systems respond to goals. And the main thing that we see is that systems over time correct for your mistakes. And in theory, this improves the utility of the team. So the robot listens to you a little bit less, but it sort of gives you results and you, you benefit from that. What happens, though, is if you start to introduce the fact that you might be designing things wrong, you might be leaving things out, now you start to lose this probability. So, what we have here is down on the left, you're missing features where there are things you've left out of the specification. And what I'm showing here is in the very first round of the interaction, the system actually doesn't do what you ask it to you if you only have one feature that's included. Over time, if you have too many features, things kind of correct out. But in this missing features area, we see these persistent failures. And that sort of seems to show up persistently over time as we continue. And so we looked at this in a paper called Consequences of Misaligned AI. And we built up a model where we assumed that there's a true reward function, R star, that depends on some features, R to the L. And there's a proxy that depends on a subset of those features. So lots of things we care about, only a small set we can measure. And then we assumed that there's a shared resource constraint between those. An example might be if you are optimizing a recommendation system newsfeed. These features might be in order of complexity, things like clicks, engagement, prevalence of hate speech, or maybe community well-being. We find is that optimizing for that proxy continues to do well. So this blue line is showing your proxy utility, so it goes up and up and up. But your overall utility goes up and then crests and falls. And this is that specification gap coming back again. And what's interesting is that I didn't pick, cherry pick this set of options. Actually, for any proxy you can select in this toy problem, the same property happens. And we're able to show that this is not just this individual problem, but actually for a really broad category of problems. If you have these shared resources and incomplete goals, you see this consistent property of true utility going up and then falling off. And you can think of this as there being two phases of incomplete optimization. In phase one, where incomplete optimization works, you're largely reallocating resources between the things you can measure. This is good. This is sort of removing slack from the problem in some sense. But at some point, you hit Pareto optimality there. There's nothing you can do by just reassigning things between those values. Instead, 
what the optimization switches to do is to extracting resources from the things you're not measuring and reallocating them back to the things that you are measuring. And this is a fundamental property of optimizing systems that's very hard to work around. Given time, that's where I'm going to end my talk. Thank you all so much, and it was a pleasure.